my name's Melissa Terrace. I'm a professor at the University of Edinburgh and I specialise in digital cultural heritage, so in digitisation of gallery, library, archive and museum collections. And I also look after a lot of digital research for the arts, humanities and social sciences. So when we consider the main benefits of Open Glam, we often think about access and access is really important as it allows a whole variety of people to contribute or to get well, access to materials online, but I think it should go further than that. I think the main benefit of Open Glam is actually about social aspects i think that there is ideas of social justice in there and making sure that a wide variety of people can get access to information about society and information about culture and information about people and i think when we just frame it as access it's too narrow in lots of ways i do think there's a political element to this and I do think it's about equality and I do think it's about diversity. And I think by making the main collections that we have available digitally, what we're doing is we're opening up access and that's a matter of social justice. So in my experience, the barriers to open glam are often procedural rather than technical. So there are often people that don't quite get the message or understand what's happening and barriers that are put in place from committees, from management, from boards, from funders, from politicians. It can often be very top down. The level of no can be top down people don't understand why we should be giving away the resources that we have and the prime beautiful wonderful resources that we have why should we be giving them away for free and there's a sense of ownership still and there's a sense that of value and we have to explore different meanings of value around digital cultural heritage that it might not always be a financial transaction that people access these things for, but they're different types of values. And so I think the barrier really is an understanding that there isn't really much money in digital open glam, but we should be able to use them for different ways to encourage lots of people to engage and to encourage access. So when I think about the conversations I've had about Open Glam, I think one of the main ones is with Fred Saunderson, who's the copyright manager at the National Library of Scotland. And when I first moved back to um, Edinburgh a few years ago, um, I was saying to him, why isn't the National Library doing more in Open Glam? And why aren't institutions doing more in this space? And we had a really honest conversation. And he explained to me some of the levers that are in place to, for major organisations, not just the National Library of Scotland, but many national organisations, and how conservative the decision-making processes were around not just open glam, but anything digital and how it's often board members, it's often managers, it's often politicians that are putting the, and the government that are putting the pressure on organisations and organisations themselves are conservative beasts and they're not allowed to bite the hands that feed them. And so actually talking about open glam involves reaching out to a whole different constituency of people to persuade them that it's a good idea to allow these things to be approved. And I think that will take time. And that conversation with Fred really opened up my eyes to how complex this is, because it's not just about whether we make resources free or not. It's also about how we change institutional cultures and how we change management cultures and how we change these decision making processes to support opening access and freedom. And I do think about that conversation a lot. And, and um, since then, I've been trying to get on as many boards as possible so I can put my hand up and um, encourage open glam. And I think there's a place for that, for people making sure that they get part of the decision making processes around this to allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. So my personal message to those who are considering opening their collections and hesitating, 
what's the worst that could happen if you give this stuff away? What's the worst that could happen? And if you can't figure out how to make money out of this stuff, why are you putting barriers in place for other people to take this by putting it out online into, under non-commercial licenses or commercial licenses allowing reuse by different people? What is the point in keeping everything locked down? And I think that framed within the current year and a half that we've all had with the pandemic, we've seen the benefit of digitized collections. We've seen the benefit of open licensed digital collections. And it really is about the value that these have to society. And we need to think broader rather than this just being about revenue and image revenue. And we need to support equality of access, diversity, and making sure that people can get access to the world's cultural heritage. Mm -hmm.